Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, this is Mark de Swan Ayons, and I'm very, very happy today to uh, welcome uh, Keith Reed to our Hello. Human Rising Growth series. Keith, it's fantastic to see you. Where are you, and how are you? Um, I'm uh, at my home in Surrey, which is just south of London. Um, and it's sort of, I suppose, the equivalent would be it's the, it's the Greenwich, C Connecticut to New York. So most people here um, are sort of in semi-country and uh, commute to London. Uh, and this is my office, uh, but this is uh, more of my uh, life now, given I have a, a sort of portfolio role. Uh, I'm very well. Uh, the sun has been out. It's a little bit cloudy today. The sun has been out and um, the garden looks absolutely fabulous. Um, so yeah. that's all good. Well, I'm in uh, Woodstock, New York, which is two hours north. Um, it's not quite Greenwich, Connecticut. It's the, uh, the, the cheap version of that. It's actually the rough version of that. Uh, we're in the Catskills. And um, here, until last week, the temperature didn't go above 10 degrees. We really were still in winter. But finally, um, we have a long weekend. Memorial Day is on Monday. And um, uh, the sun is out and the temperature is up in the 70s, uh, so 20s. Um, I'm very happy that we have the time today. As, uh, as you know, uh, and as many of the participants in this webinar uh, know, this is a series that we do every Friday called the Humanizing Growth Series. Uh, and in it, we talk to leaders, um, primarily marketing leaders and CEOs. Although we are bringing in some of the C-suite peers, like we had the... Um, um, CFO of ADECO, the world's largest uh, placement agency uh, in the world, uh, on two weeks ago. And um, today, obviously, Keith, um, uh, you are going to be talking a lot about your history at Unilever. But I, um, but I want to start with uh, congratulations, because uh, this week uh, your new role was announced. Am I right? Thank you. Yes. So, so um, I'm joining the board of Sainsbury's, which is um, a large retailer in the UK. Um, also, actually, uh, it's sort of mainly supermarkets, but it also owns Argos, so it's a combination of food and, and then also um, a sort of direct-to-consumer uh, electrical and, and uh, non-food items. Oh, fantastic. And of course, you're also on the board of WPP, one of the uh, partners of the Institute uh, for Real Growth. Um, so the Institute is, um, is an entity that uh, is only a year old now, um, and um, we have as our purpose to connect uh, growth leaders to best practices, learning, and each other, as well as experts, around driving real growth, which we define as um, human-centric growth that is oriented towards a multi-stakeholder audience. Um, and, and we'll talk a, a lot about that. But um, I, I want to jump, jump right in. I, I have too many questions for us to cover, and, and I know that your story is a rich one. Um, but I want to also encourage uh, listeners and uh, viewers right now I suddenly feel like a TV presenter, <laughs> to uh, use the Q&A um, facility. I will be reading that. And um, uh, after we get through the first part of this interview or conversation, I will be inserting your questions to um, Keith as, uh, as I feel it fits the conversation. Um, now, Keith, we've talked a few times over the years about uh, your journey as a marketing leader first. That was, uh, we actually collaborated on the Marketing 2020 HBR article, of course. And then um, later as uh, your role as a, a change leader, really, uh, a growth leader within Unilever. And I was um, listening back to uh, the last recording and uh, you talked about uh, 2009, Paul Pullman, who incidentally I'm speaking with next week, which will be a lot of fun to be able to bring the two stories together. Um, he said to you, never waste a good crisis. And, uh, and that was the start of a 10 year journey that we will be talking about now. But um, he said that then post the 2008 crisis and here we sit, not even able to go to our offices mm -hmm. after a much bigger crisis. So um, it strikes me that the, the time to have this conversation uh, couldn't be more ripe. No? Yes, I mean it's it's um, it's remarkable about the uh, impact everyone uh, is in right now, and I hope all people listening are are well and um, uh, and are s safe and uh, manage to navigate these very challenging times. And uh, I know we'll be talking generally, but 
of course, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, people have had all sorts of different experiences over these past few weeks. And, and you know, the only thing I'd say in the conversation we're about to uh, have, Mark, is, um, you know, some things that, that I'll be saying will be the, um, the bleeding obvious. Um, and uh, hopefully that will confirm things that people are already thinking about and say, yeah, that makes sense and I'll, I'll carry on. There'll be other things which uh, might challenge uh, what people are, are thinking or doing right now. And, that, and that's good as well. That'd be a good result because then you think like, oh, maybe I should rethink this um, uh, or reframe this. Uh, and hopefully there might even be some new ideas as well. Whichever of those three, uh, for me, it'll be a successful time uh, spent together because what I'm keen to do, uh, and um, you know, I, I do this more and more now, is uh, try and engage with people uh, from different places uh, in this whole sort of journey, which I think uh, mankind is, is uh, uh, or humankind is on um, in business. Uh, and that is uh, uh, very much about getting businesses to, to really go back to where they used to be. Businesses start by serving society, serving people. And if you served uh, a person with a, with a product or a service better than someone else, uh, your business would grow and, and, and the, the other person, the competitor's business, uh, would decline. And uh, I think somewhere in the 80s and 90s, businesses sort of uh, lost that sort of um, that compass and started yeah. getting to selling more stuff. And when you get to selling more stuff, I think you then uh, ultimately do not put the consumer um, and society uh, in the center of your business, but you put all sorts of other things, including um, shareholders, et cetera, which are very important, don't get me wrong, but it's not uh, what businesses are about as far as serving consumers uh, and customers. And I think 2009 was a really good example of that. Um, I had been running a global laundry and household care business for Unilever. Um, and it was a business that five years previously, I was asked by the then CEO, Patrick Sesco, to, um, to turn around one of those famous things. It was a declining business, quite unusual really, because laundry is, is one of the cornerstone categories of Unilever. That's where it all started, you know, Lever Brothers. Um, and um, what was quite striking, the business was declining, household care, the home care business was up for sale. Uh, we'd already sold frozen foods and prestige and Unilever. And this was the next one on the chopping block. Um, and, and could we turn it around? And the next five years, I learned an awful lot. The first thing I learned actually is you can't turn businesses around very quickly. Um, and I got very um, shaken by my, my initial lack of success and, uh, uh, and those um, who were on the journey with me will remember it, it, you know, the, uh, the declining business carried on declining. You know? The trend is your friend. Um, and I thought, um, oh my God, I made a terrible mistake here. Um, and what I really should have done is um, carried on uh, where I was before and taking on this great challenge as it was presented to me uh, was going to turn into a great disaster. But the good news uh, in following really basic uh, things, I mean, we call things strategy, but strategy is really about choices and, and focusing on, on, on choices. Um, on, on laundry, it was just getting back to being consumer focused and really appreciating that the majority of the world washed their clothes by hand um, and indeed uh, from that um, uh, made the right sort of products and um, started taking on our competition, which was P&G, who was very much winning then and Unilever had lost. And at the end of that story, uh, I'd built also the Cleaner Planet Plan, which was the first sort of foray into a sustainability plan. And then Paul arrived. Um, and um, you know, Paul uh, was uh, keen to assemble a new executive team. And he basically put together half people from outside Unilever, which at the time was very unusual uh, because most people uh, sort of grew up and got promoted within Unilever. And then half from people within Unilever. And uh, at that stage, laundry and household care was growing again. In fact, the fastest growing business that Unilever had. I hasten to add, uh, 10 years later, still the fastest growing business Unilever has. So sustained growth. Um, and he asked me to do this job, which I have to say, to start with, um, I didn't think sounded like a good idea. Um, and he said, I want you to be the chief marketing officer, um, and I want you to run sustainability, and I want you to run communications. And um, what we really want to do is reinvent the way business is done and put sustainability, environmental and social sustainability at the core of the business. 
Can um, I interrupt and- you for two seconds there? Because I think you make a really important point, which um, a lot of our participants um, have uh, perhaps discussed, but I don't know if that has landed. Um, you and, uh, for example, Jim Stengel, your counterpart, you just mentioned Procter & Gamble. I think he's actually um, uh, listening and, uh, and, and watching this as well. Um, you both, as well as a, a number of other, uh, I would call them big CMOs, the Da Vinci CMOs, had had the marketing role, had moved on to a P&L role. In other words, you've, you've gotten your credibility and, 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 and the fastest growing category so, and, and more as a business leader. And we're almost um, tempted back for a role which was called chief marketing officer, although I know there were some additions there, but it was actually a much bigger role. And, and I, I think how he enticed you to play that role is, is good for everybody to hear, and, but also to realize that there's two stages there. You'd done the marketing bit, the functional bit, and now the, the brief was much bigger, wasn't it? Yeah, so I, I think um, uh, the, the way, well, absolutely, first of all, absolutely right. You know, I'd run business, I'd run the UK business, I'd run a you know, global business. Um, and um, I hasten to add, you know, when um, uh, Unilever was uh, not doing well um, uh, in laundry and, um, and hence we had to turn it around, um, that is when Jim uh, was indeed the CMO of, of Procter & Gamble. So um, if he is online, well done, Jim. Um, I hasten to add, uh, Jim then left um, and during my time uh, is Unilever that got momentum and, um, and started a uh, growing share. Um, so luckily we never competed directly against each other. But it's always, always good to see uh, Jim. No, but I, I think the point um, was um, Paul was keen that, um, to, to bring together something that was uh, a strategic change uh, for Unilever. He often said that um, at the end of the day, you know, on the executive, there were people who were running North America or Europe. And although they were Unilever, their primary focus was North America or Europe, or people running tea and ice cream or whatever. Um, uh, and personal care, but their primary focus was that. And he said, well, you know, the role I want you to do is be able to see across Unilever um, and uh, help uh, me reinvent uh, the way uh, business is done and the way business is done in, in Unilever. Um, so, so yes, very much so um, started off, actually started off just doing a, a, a really uh, comprehensive piece of trends work in understanding um, where the business is going. And one of the things I'd say to everyone who, uh, is online as a CMO. As I often used to tease uh, our very good CFO, Graham Piketty, um, that his job was to count where the money was going and that it was spent uh, responsibly. But my job was to work out where the money was coming from uh, and how we were going to grow into the future. And I think if you can, as a marketeer, own the outside, bring the outside in and the future forward, right now with all the uncertainty, uh, being able to show uh, this is where the world's going and this is where we could go is a tremendous relief to your colleagues uh, on the executive. And so we did a, a big piece of, of um, trends work uh, and, and came up with you know, 20 big trends and, and four mega trends within that. And unsurprisingly, uh, you'll say now, you know, one of them was uh, about sustainable um, uh, challenges and the environment. You know, just a... Uh, to emphasize a point, and you were one of the contributors to um, the CMO profile, the growth CMO profile called the Da Vinci Growth Profile. Number one on that list is decoding the world, um, a testimony to the plea you just made. But I think it's also good to uh, emphasize that's not just about owning information about the customer, is it? It's not no. just about consumer insights. No, I think it's, it's, it's uh, a business as well, because um, one of the other trends was uh, about the, the world going digital. Um, and you'll say, well, OK, that's, that makes sense. No, no, no. Ten years ago, when we did this piece of work, uh, it wasn't obvious that to a soup and soap company like Unilever, the digital will have any meaningful uh, impact. Um, and um, I did one of the very early trips to Silicon Valley. Uh, I took the executives with us. This is the, the time when you used to actually sit down with Mark Zuckerberg and, um, and, and the like and, um, uh, and, and chat about sort of uh, how advertising could impact uh, Facebook or indeed, of course, uh, the other big companies you've seen down, yes, absolutely Google and Amazon, but also Yahoo, of course, was a very big company then. Um, and Apple had just launched the iPad. I remember um, handing out iPads to, uh, to the people uh, on, the, on the trip. But these were understanding from a business perspective as well, what was going to uh, impact uh, Unilever. And 
And I felt my job, as I say, was outside in, future forward. Uh, and I've been going to the uh, Consumer Electronics Show uh, in, in Vegas you know, every year for the last 10 years. Was there, in fact, this January, uh, Alan Joke, the CEO of Unilever Now, asked me to come back and, uh, and take him and the Unilever executive to, to CES. And uh, at the end of last year, I um, um, helped lead uh, actually a trip for the Unilever board to go to Silicon Valley, um, even though you know, I left Unilever last May. So I think the answer is, is this is about multi-stakeholder um, and yes. it's about understanding how a business goes together. And absolutely, consumer customer for me is in the center. In fact, a Unilever used to say, our number one priority is our, our consumer. Um, and then we went on and talked about our, 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 um, our, our retailers and our employees. And, that. and he said, and if all those are well satisfied, our um, shareholders will be well rewarded. Right. And the notion is that the shareholders being rewarded because we're doing our job well and the business is vibrant was, uh, was a sort of a key part of that multi-stakeholder approach. But let me just okay. unpack this multi-stakeholder a little bit more because the big thing about multi-stakeholder approach is, is really, as a marketer, is not getting caught up that it's about just about brands and advertising and consumers. I think as a marketer, it is about owning the, 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 the growth levers out to all your different audiences and be able to bring that to the board table. And um, if we go back to the, the origins of, of, of Unilever and back to uh, William Hethcoth Lever, or Lord Leverhulme as he became, uh, he was quite a, a social entrepreneur in, in so many ways. And he saw the dirt and squalor of Victoria and England and very much felt that, that there was something he could do about it. And um, the thing that he could do about it was uh, take soap to the masses. There was a, a great quote I saw in the archives of, of uh, Unilever. And it's a quote from Disraeli, who was the prime minister. And Disraeli said, you know, England is a country divided in two. Uh, for one, the sun never sets. For the other, the sun never rises. Mm. The haves and the have-nots. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, Lord Leverhulme uh, basically said, you know, I'm going to take soap to the masses. And he launched one of the first brands, actually, in the world. I mean, there were always brands, and you know, Ford and uh, brand Lipton Tea, etc. But those were brands named after their founders, uh, Thomas Lipton uh, and, uh, and others. And he was one of the first to actually create a brand called Sunlight. And he built the largest private port in the world, up in Port Sunlight, as it was called, near Liverpool in northwest England, and started exporting Port Sunlight uh, materials of Sunlight Soap and Life Boy Soap uh, around the world. And this is way before EY and uh, McKinsey were saying uh, we should have purpose statements. And he had a purpose statement. He wanted to make cleanliness commonplace. Cleanliness commonplace. Um, and uh, you're very apt actually for today. Um, and indeed, uh, to this day, you know, Unilever is still uh, the, uh, the largest soap company in the world. And um, it's interesting seeing the ads being done right now during COVID-19. Um, and whether it be Dove um, ads or Lifebuoy ads or whichever soap brand, they very much uh, talk to the benefits of washing your hands uh, with soap, which indeed is yeah. the first line defense. Yeah. But then it says, but wash your hands with Dove or any soap. Um, and they even put logos up of the, of the competitors. So they make it much, oh, more, seen that. <laughs> uh, much more of a public service. And I think what's good about that, it, it, then they're not sort of seen as taking advantage, but more service to society. Well, you know, I, I just wanted to chip in and add to that, that um, we, you know, I've been based in the US now for um, 25 years, actually. And um, talking about purpose, um, so often I find that um, the, the Americans say, yeah, well, that's, you know, that European thing. Uh, that's, they can do that. And, 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 it's, and it's absolutely not true. And, you know, exactly at the same time as Lord Lever was working up in the north of England, uh, Hershey was building a village which had childcare, which had education, which had safety uh, and health. And, and it's, it's, it's a, a blueprint. In fact, I, I'd argue, and you said that a little bit uh, earlier, that um, that was why people started companies to make a difference, not to make a lot of money. Uh, they, did, they made money if they made a big difference. And somewhere we'll get to that, people and companies lost their way. But, you know, this, this, this conversation in many ways is about codifying your learning because I believe, and that's why it's so special to have Paul next week as well, uh, as, as the IRG, we believe that there is 
a blueprint there. Everybody will have to do their version of it. But the, there's something there to be emulated. So you started by saying, look, I, uh, we started with the consumer. Actually, we started with stakeholder understanding, decoding the world. We created that as a basis of a strategy process. And I, I'd love you to continue with that journey so that we really do hear that. Yeah, so um, uh, the, the, the other sort of big trends, um, other than the uh, digital revolution that I talked to, uh, about, uh, was people living differently. Um, so that, again, as understanding uh, the big shift that was going on in the world um, and uh, people moving into towns. Uh, if you move into uh, towns, you go from um, cooking, squatting down on a fire to uh, cooking, standing up on, on liquid petroleum gas. And if you stand up, you have surfaces either side of you and you have surfaces that need cleaning. If you go from uh, outside to inside, you need toilets in, in towns, etc. So it was really understanding the, uh, the big needs of the world um, and be able to build a business accordingly. But the one I would like to emphasize a little bit, which goes much more into the, the territory you're talking about, was the, the need to um, create a more sustainable world going forward. And I think whatever business you work in, this still remains a huge opportunity. And, and we created this thing called the Sustainable Living Plan, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, uh, which I hasten to brand. Um, and uh, the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan had some differences then. Uh, and there are things, of course, much more common now 10 years ago. But firstly, um, it was to look at the whole value chain so this was saying we're not just looking at our footprint, we're going to look at our suppliers um, and you know, where the raw materials come. And we're going to look the other way, how our consumers use our products and dispose of our products. And we're responsible for the whole of that value chain. And still, actually, most businesses don't do that. More do, but most don't. So this would be like the car industry saying we're responsible for the oil industry. Um, and, and the creation of um, gas and petrol, etc. Yeah. So I, I think that was a, an important part for Unilever because it really made us face into the issue about um, uh, agricultural raw materials. You know, if we carried on the way we did, Unilever was the biggest tea company in the world, the world would run out of tea. There was not enough sustainable tea to, uh, uh, to, to uh, give everyone uh, a cup of tea um, into the future with another two billion people joining the planet. So the thought about growing agricultural materials sustainably became uh, critical, not just because it's the right thing to do, but actually to, to future-proof uh, the business. Uh, similarly, uh, not just looking at um, uh, where the, uh, the value chain before us, but the value chain after us, how consumers were using and disposing of the product was, was a part of our footprint as well. Uh, and in doing that, it really opened our eyes and, and you know, at the time, um, we were looking at about 7% of our agricultural raw materials being sourced sustainably, uh, and now it's virtually 100%. So you know, the, the journey of that 10 years was, was significant, but we did turn to our suppliers and say, look, we're on this journey, come with us. If you don't come with us, by the way, you won't be one of our suppliers in the future. So we gave people years and years of notice and worked with them to go, you can't just overnight say, you know, give me um, at the scale of Unilever, you know, every day two and a half billion people use the Unilever products. At that scale, you can't turn it over overnight. Well, and you know, I, I, I wanna bring something in that I know is important to you and lots of people just don't know. When you, when you say the word, words become laden. And when you say the word sustainable, even if it's sustainable growth, it's translated to green. And um, I think an important addition to make is that you, you really broaden that definition of sustainability to include social. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. I know it was later. Yeah. But still. And that was a very good point. When we started the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan, uh, just as it, that's good conversation, um, uh, thanks for being a very good coach and interviewer here. Uh, uh, we were very environmentally focused. Um, and so I, I mentioned about that. I was, you know, we also had uh, targets around uh, 100% you know, uh, renewables for um, power, first of all, electricity achieved, and then uh, total power, um, and um, you know, uh, making sure that we took zero uh, waste to landfill from our factories. These were massive targets which were achieved on the way. But also what we realized was the importance of society. And in fact, absolutely to your point, it, it ended up being environmental, social, and economic sustainability. And, and in social, we then brought in everything, of course, diversity and inclusion, uh, but also about you know, how you'd help um, you know, uh, women entrepreneurs, 
um, believed or not, uh, most of um, uh, the world's farming uh, is, is actually done by women, um, smallholder farmers, Unilever sources from over one and a half million smallholder farmers around the world. The vast majority of those farmers are women. Um, and you won't be surprised, the vast majority of land that they are farming on is owned by men. Uh, so that inequality uh, is still very striking to this day. And we started then working on this and saying, how could we work in a multi-stakeholder way uh, to get uh, society to work in the right way? How could we help these um, smallholder farmers to be able to source sustainably because we wanted that. And actually, if they worked sustainably, it was actually more efficient and, uh, and they would get uh, better yields uh, from their land. So we tried to make it joined up. Um, and the notion about serving society as well, I, I think is key because, I mean, let's talk about right now, a good example. Um, and I'll kick it clean with the, the Unilever example, although I feel a little guilty because um, I'm using Unilever a lot, but of course, we, you know, I was there for many years and, and, and did this role for nine. But right now, you know, around the factories uh, in, in the UK, because I've just been chatting to someone in the UK, um, you know, the local community, the hospitals, uh, so not only has Unilever you know, supplied um, uh, hand wash and sanitizers and, and skin creams to, to carers and nurses and doctors, as you'd imagine they do, They've even put in ice cream uh, freezers into the hospitals with free ice cream because it's been pretty hot here. So the, the nurses and, and, uh, and carers and doctors can help themselves to a free ice cream. And of course, the workers of those factories work in that community. Um, and so it's, it is also a reward back to your, to your employers that you, um, you, you help the community you're in. And, and I, you know, one thing that really struck me um, uh, with... Um, uh, with, with water as, as a big challenge and a, one of the big challenges you're taking on that, you know, if you have a factory in India or Africa in a water stressed place um, and you are shipping water in in tankers to your factories past drought ridden villages, uh, you have a societal problem. Uh, and now when we build factories, we build factories to ensure that we can uh, get enough water, not just for the factory, but then to serve the community as well. All right, I, I, um, it, it, and, and because it's so relevant now, I want to uh, go back to the journey. So what I see, and I think that this is very representative for uh, companies today, is there's Paul, there's you, and a small cadre of people that Paul has now had the opportunity to bring into his leadership team. And, um, and there is this vision of uh, perhaps, uh, in, in many ways, going back to the roots of, uh, of, of driving growth for all stakeholders with the understanding that it will be uh, financially the smart thing to do as well. Paul, of course, uh, famously on his first, uh, in his first week announced that quarterly reporting was out. He, um, he talked in other interviews about uh, actually um, sort of going through the current stakeholder, the shareholders at that time and making sure that, they, that Unilever had the right type of shareholders, people that were interested in long-term growth, not in a quick buck. Um, but so now you're, you're setting this strategy and uh, I'd love you to take us through how you did two things. One, in your role as um, responsible for the stakeholder engagement broadly outside the organization, really, how did you engage? Who did you engage with? What does that multi-stakeholder engagement look like? But also, and perhaps start there, internally. I mean, yes, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, you realize this is the right thing to do because it's back to the roots and it feels right. But there's a lot of people that don't have the information you have that perhaps came in in a phase that it was about making money and, and it was more business oriented and they don't even know what those roots are. So can you talk about the internal and the external engagement process as you, when you had your strategy? Yeah, well, to be clear, it is about uh, making money as well. So I, I really want to emphasize that because funny enough, I've had the same conversations with uh, people, particularly in the US, uh, where they say, you know, but what is the business case for sustainability, uh, yeah. environmental and social sustainability? And yeah. I always answer, you know, I'd love to see the business case for the alternative. I'd love to see the business case for destroying the very planet we live in, the business case for destroying the very societies we're trying to serve. So I, I do think this is also about business delivery. And I hasten yeah. to add, 
in those nine years. And Paul will say the same because it's the same. Uh, well, he was 10 years, I suppose, as CEO. I was nine years, nine and a half as, uh, as CMO. Um, every year we grew sales <laughs> and every year we grew profit. And uh, we uh, tripled the share price and delivered 290 uh, shareholder returns. So well, that's why this case is so important. Uh, this that was about hard-nosed business delivery, but it was, it was done through um, uh, a strategic shift. And, and so the first thing is, is um, uh, and I know you're speaking to Paul, so uh, he'll, I'm sure he'll talk a bit to this, so I don't really want to, because um, uh, otherwise people won't come back and listen to Paul, and he's well worth listening to. No, no. Um, but he, Paul gave me communications as well, and um, and I didn't really quite understand why at the time. But it, you know, and I, if you're CMO now, I would start making a good uh, case uh, for taking over communications as well, because in a, a joined-up internet world, you can't have two people on the executive managing the the narrative and, and the story. And an internal memo one day can be an external memo another day, um, and indeed. What I could do is I could join up the story. So you talk about engagement with stakeholders, uh, intern and outside. You know, uh, I got all the communications team, which uh, was, was several hundred people, to report directly into uh, Sue Garrard and then into me. Um, and in doing so, we could very much um, get the discipline of a, of a single-minded story. You know, and you lives in 190 countries, so you can imagine the amount of external engagement. And I'm a great believer one of the best ways to communicate to your internal audience is uh, through external communication. Because mm. if you say something, well, you know, Mark, you would say that. But if you read it in the Wall Street Journal, then it starts becoming, you know, the truth as such. So one of the, uh, the exercises was to uh, really uh, leverage the joined up nature of marketing and communications uh, and to find a way uh, to, to deliver a very single minded message. Uh, and this was building on the, uh, the purpose that Lord Leverhulme had about making cleanliness commonplace to say that we wanted to make sustainable living commonplace. And the idea that Unilever did uh, food and hygiene and cleaning and self-esteem and, uh, and basically was the foundation of uh, everyday life. Uh, and hence, if we could offer consumers a sustainable way of everyday life, we would help sustainable uh, living. Uh, and then uh, that, that classic thing about setting a, a vision and direction. I, absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. It is then about engaging everyone um, uh, with huge repetition. Um, I can remember Paul saying he was bored of a certain speech. That he'd given it five times one way or another. Um, and, and me equally saying you're going to give it ten times. You know, yes. um, is you've got to repeat and repeat and repeat. Of course, refresh and use different anecdotes and whatever. Uh, but then also appreciate your audience is different. And, and, and some people like to hear numbers. Some people like to hear that you're going to, you know, um, uh, help a billion people uh, wash their hands properly, which was a ridiculous target, a target, by the way, which has been achieved. Uh, we, uh, Unilever has, uh, in that 10 years, taught 1.2 billion people how to wash their hands properly. And, of course, a lot more uh, going on uh, right now. Some people love numbers. Other people like legacy stories. You know, we're going to whatever. Other people like like pictures, um, and you need to bring alive your your strategy through uh, visions of the future um, and where the world is going, and etc. Um, and other people, of course, just like great prose and words. And so, um, trying to mix up um, different ways of engaging people and being empathetic to people's understanding and listening styles, um, which again might not feel right for you, but what so many people do is communicate to people in a way that motivates them. And so yeah. what they're doing a great job is motivating all the people who are, who are basically plumbed like them. And what you have to do quite, quite calculating is say, ah, oh, right, I'm going to do the message this way to get to all the people who are like me, but I'm going to do message this way to get to those other people and that way to get the other people. And I got a, actually a coach from a, a person from the theatre um, who uh, helped uh, my imagination in the different ways of engaging um, with, with people. Um, and so first- I, I need to build on that for a second, because I, I think you make such an important point. Um, in this Da Vinci CMO profile, the last um, aspect of, of, of what we call these winning growth CMOs is indeed an inspiring storyteller. But inspiring is a, is a caveat because it's, it's, a, 
it's a qualifier because inspiring, as you say, to a financial uh, leader of a company, a CFO, is very looks very different than inspiring to uh, another marketeer or perhaps an NGO that you're talking to. In um, I'm, I'm going to plug the uh, IRG program for a second now because what you've just talked about is such a good uh, testimony for uh, a piece that uh, has been um, contributed to the IRG program by Exeter, the um, senior leadership uh, coaching company. All the IRG participants, these are all CMOs and growth leaders um, from over 100 uh, companies around the world, uh, go through an exercise where they map their key stakeholders internally and externally and, and actually develop messaging strategies very specifically for key influencers. And, uh, and as you say, um, that sort of set of people you're talking to has, so, has become so much bigger. Last week, you will have heard that um, we spoke with Professor Michael Diamond, who is a marketer, but he's also a communications man. And he was making the point that, um, uh, yes, they need to come together, but not necessarily under the CMO. In, in B2B, you see that, that they often come together as a, under a CCO. So the B2C companies tend to have more... Um, but it doesn't take away from the importance of having a, an integrated um, uh, messaging strategy and that incredibly personal leadership that you need to um, adapt the message. Now, you ended up talking, I think Unilever at the time was 160,000 people. Didn't you tell me that you actually face-to-face, -face, I mean, you being the group, uh, talking to almost 100,000 of those people? Uh, 90, yeah, 90,000. Um, uh, uh, 90,000 with a face. Uh, I still believe, and I know we're all uh, here on Zoom, I still believe that uh, face to face is by far the best way to engage people. Um, nice. But also to then get people to, I'm a great believer in the good old fashioned cascade, um, and to get people then to pass the message on. Because the thing is, is, is um, uh, and the reason why cognitive therapy is so important, um, I don't know if anyone reads about this stuff is um, we speak the truth, you know, pers you speak the truth, I speak the truth. So, um, uh, you know, if I think this shirt, shirt suits me um, uh, and I tell myself that, it, that's the truth, it suits me. I actually, it's my opinion. And, and if you uh, don't like this shirt, well, that's your opinion and you're wrong, Mark. But when we talk, we hear what we say. And because the way we're built, we believe we speak the truth. And so if you, um, that's one of the reasons why in cognitive therapy, they start saying, you know, stop, you know, telling yourself that, you know, life's terrible because you keep hearing it and life is it and start trying to pretend happy and, and starting to talk and think about more positive things. And similarly, if you can get people to cascade messages and they have to stand up in front of people and say, this is the direction the organization is going and this is why it's important. And, and, you know, we collectively must do this. Not only are you passing the message on, the person who's giving the message is being uh, brought on board as, as, as one of the disciples. And, uh, so how, but how do you do that, Keith? And, and this, by the way, is a question from uh, Annabel Jack. She's one of the CMOs on our program. Um, uh, how do you do that when the nature of the people that you're talking to, as you just indicated, might be very different? Let's take the CFO. Yeah. Right? I mean, here you and Paul. Now, Paul had a financial background, I know, but he came from P&G and Nestle, a lot of marketing blood running through his veins. And... How do you talk to the financial group around an inspiring strategy like the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan? So I think the answer is, is, is you, um, what you mustn't do, and this is also true uh, from a marketing perspective, you mustn't just hold on to your, your metrics um, and, and keep pointing at them and ramming them down people's throats. Uh, mm. you know, if they're important, of course, make sure you have those. But you need to take on the metrics of the organization. And I think... Um, uh, owning the, the breadth of the metrics and talking to the breadth of the metrics. I mean, I don't mean owning as in they're yours, but I mean putting them up and saying, well, this bit's working, but this bit isn't. Um, and I also believe that that level of transparency about owning up where, where things aren't working um, is, um, uh, is important because it gives credibility when things are. So I used to you know, quite willingly say, well, look, we're making these eco-efficiencies, which are, are funding the, you know, the USLP and, and surprise, surprise, uh, eco-efficiencies uh, are, are good for the planet because you're saving um, uh, the impact of the planet, but you're saving money as well. But I'd equally you know, point out that you know, we said that we'd buy all our palm oil sustainably, and sustainable palm oil is a premium price. Um, and uh, we have to own up to that premium and be really transparent about it. So part of it, I think, is being 
transparent. You won't be surprised. Uh, the CFO at the time says, yeah, don't worry, Keith, I'll take the savings, but I won't take the premium. Um, but I did try and say they have to come together and one, uh, Peter pays Paul. Uh, but I also uh, put a lot of energy on the marketing side to, uh, to save money. And we saved um, you know, literally, um, well, I say billions, certainly 1.8 billion uh, over that time in, in, in marketing efficiencies. And I think it was important to do that as part of the credibility. So. I think part of it is uh, being just as willing to talk about um, cash flow um, uh, or just as willing to talk about the, um, the savings program as the CFO. Ne ne never let the CFO um, own some metrics that they can then beat you over the head with. Um, if anyone's going to beat you over the head, beat yourself over the head um, in front of the CFO. And then you'll think, uh, he or she will think you're taking it seriously uh, and, 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 and seeing the full picture. Because marketers can pick and choose um, their data to to. We've sort of been known to do that. So so let's get back to the journey. So you you're you're engaging internally. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about the? So you you'd been a CFO a CMO functionally before, but now this was different because now you own comms, um, and you were engaging with a, a much broader multi-stakeholder. Um, set outside Unilever. Talk a little yeah. bit about how that was. Yeah, so I mean, NGOs. So when I first came in um, uh, at the very beginning, we had uh, people from Greenpeace dressed in orangutan outfits climbing on the front of Unilever House. I remember. Um, and um, uh, the line to me from my board colleagues, my executive colleagues was, Keith, sort that out, you know. Um, uh, and this was all about palm oil. And this is before the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, I hasten to say, wind forward um, uh, eight years uh, when uh, Kraft Heinz uh, were making the uh, very bold um, takeover bid of Unilever. Uh, and we had a very comprehensive plan to defend uh, Unilever. And week one was all about um, the uh, economic success of Unilever and driving value. And week two, which we never got to, but was going to be a communication about our values. So it's about value and values. Um, and, and show you the difference in, in change. In that week two, uh, Greenpeace were going to come out um, in support of Unilever um, uh, in that week two, which is would be extraordinary. Greenpeace supporting a multinational, yeah. but what they're basically saying is we want more multinationals like Unilever who are trying to make a positive difference, even though they'd agree uh, very quickly that we're not getting it completely right, and I would say that as well, rather than um, you know, multinationals have a, a different point of view. So, yes, I went out to meet Save the Children and uh, UNICEF, etc. Uh, uh, you, I started the Unilever Foundation um, to be very proactively uh, engage um, uh, with these uh, different stakeholders. Uh, I did a lot of listening. I mean, you know, you, you've got to listen, listen to understand, not listen to be seen to listen, but listen to understand. And we invited them in. And and we used to report every year the progress we were making against the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Uh, you won't be surprised all the success and achievement metrics were presented by Paul, our CEO. And all the targets we were missing was presented by me. Um, <laughs> no, but you, know, you make such an important point. <laughs> don't remind him of that because he will remember it differently. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. He's watching was, this. He's watching. Was, I'm sure it's just sharing. Oh, okay. sharing. Yeah, but he but, did a brilliant, brilliant job of transparency. Paul was, was Mr. Transparency. He would say, we've got to tell everyone what we're doing well, but we've got to tell everyone what we're doing badly. Well, you know, that's, I wanted to, actually, I, I want to stand still on that for a second. Uh, I, it's, you remind me of a conversation that I had with uh, Tex Gunning, who um, went on to lead um, the, the, the world's number one or two paint company. Yeah. Uh, which is an incredibly polluting process. I mean, the paint factories are not pleasant places to live around, I can tell you. Um, and he talked about, the, and this is also uh, over a decade ago, but he talked about engaging with the NGOs that cared, and there were lots of them around what the, this industry was doing, and saying, look, people need paint. There's lots of reasons why you need paint. If you don't use paint, your buildings collapse, your wood rots, and all that. So there's very good functional reasons for using paint. And... And we agree that it doesn't, um, that, that, that there is lots of polluting um, consequences, but we want to get better. And so on this point of transparency, again, I think there are many parts of the world where people, and perhaps this is personal, feel they can't have the conversation until there's good news. Mm -hmm. And I think the bigger point you're making is no, 
start when it's bad news start when uh, but with full transparency as long as you're willing to go the journey that there has to be effort and intent and improvement on that journey but start with transparency right yeah, well, no, I think the, um, the, you, 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 uh, the answer in, in the question, I think what you have to do is uh, set bold ambition, uh, ambitious targets, um, and then be very transparent. I can remember uh, at that very beginning, the Unilever board saying, but hold on, we're setting targets we don't even know how to, to achieve. And I said, no, we don't. And some we won't achieve, but others we will. And, and we did surprise ourselves. Some ones were much easier to achieve than others. Um, and, and some we, I don't think we'll ever uh, achieve. But the NGOs never gave us a, a seriously hard time because at the end of the day, we said, this is where we're going. This, this is directional. This is what we're trying to achieve. And we had 50 time-based targets and you can track our progress. And, and when we were missing targets, we'd say, look, could someone help us here? We don't know how to achieve this target. And, yeah. and you know, the amazing thing about the startup world and the partnerships, someone stepped forward and say, well, have you thought of this or, or that? So I think it's working in a, in a more, more broad, extended way. And I don't feel you have to come up with all the answers. Well, it, it, I mean, and, and we'll go on back to the journey, but I, to emphasize this point, we're obviously, we're now um, in, a, in, a, in a totally new environment. Everybody's talking about the, the new reality or the next reality, and we don't know what it's going to look like. But we did a poll among the IRG participants last week, uh, a good uh, 60 of them, uh, and, and we asked, to what degree will your future strategy uh, be more human-centric, multi-stakeholder centric? And uh, it was 78% uh, of people said that not only was there uh, more of a sense of understanding of the importance of human centricity, but also a, a willingness now to insert that into the strategy. But I think people don't know how. And what you're saying is, doesn't matter that you don't know how, but if you are true to the intent and you're willing to be transparent and engage, people are actually gonna help you. It's back to the open innovation of Procter & Gamble and your foundry and so. If you state the intent, people will come with answers that you haven't thought of. And anyway, I wanna get back to your journey, how, how it then went, but it's so important because people are writing those strategies now and they're gonna be talking about them very soon. So, um... Big, bold vision, what do you want to ever call it? Strategy, vision, purpose, you know, name something you want to go after. Um, and um, is one thing. The next thing then is uh, to, of course, you know, develop a plan uh, against that. We have the Union Stay on the Living Plan. Then engaging everyone, um, and, and really everyone, um, inside and outside uh, the business at scale. Um, and then, of course, deliver. Um, and you've got to really manage uh, uh, delivery uh, and and have you say transparent metrics so yes of course I've talked about the metrics we had on on the environment whether that being around waste or water or electricity we had societal ones on, on, on diversity and inclusion uh, but also then through to um, uh, supporting smallholder farmers and creating livelihoods uh, yes. etc um, and, uh, and then start charging over time but be willing to change as well um, I know uh, we got accused occasionally of changing metrics because they were too difficult to achieve and we're ducking. We said, well, absolutely, uh, we haven't been able to achieve this, but be mad to carry on doing something like that. So we're going to change to do that uh, instead. But then the, in parallel, I think you have to sort of uh, manage the, the energy of the organization and the energy of your, of your team. And I'm a great believer in, in the first thing you need to do is manage your own energy because if you're low in energy, I guarantee no matter how good you are, you'll be transmitting that to the people uh, around you. And there are some people who walk into a room and suck the very oxygen out of the air. Uh, yeah. And with that, all opportunity and possibility go, go out the window as well. But there are other people who bring possibilities and opportunities. Um, and, um, you know, I think what you need to try and do is, is, is bring that sort of uh, positive energy. And I'm not suggesting that you need to be 100% Tigger every day. Um, but you don't need to be 100% Eeyore either. And I think that's very true to the to the you terms of... that, please? <laughs> We're talking Winnie <laughs> the Pooh, are we? Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay. Yeah, because at the end of the day, um, you know, people right now are under a lot of stress and strains, and that's totally understandable. Um, yeah. But I do think that uh, in that sort of term, I know all HR people hate about radiators and drains. Uh, of course, we're all a bit up and down at different times, but be 
you know, more of, uh, of a radiator and less, less of a drain in, in, in managing the dynamics. So looking at the plan and uh, uh, you know, trying to find the positive way forward and engaging people uh, on that journey. Uh, I'm a great believer that leadership is, is helping people be at their best uh, more of the time. And well, sorry, no, sorry uh, I, 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 I cut you off. Uh, okay, that's uh, uh, yeah. all your time. And, and, and what we all are is, uh, we all are a bit brilliant, um, a bit mediocre, and a bit shitty. And if you can get people to be shitty less of the time and brilliant more of the time across the whole business, the whole business lifts. Um, and if you can get people to play on the front foot and invest in their success and the business success, um, I, I think this can make a huge difference. But you need a plan, a strategy, and an engagement plan uh, to make that happen. Well, it's interesting because you've... You've, we, we've talked about your role as a change leader in, in, in an organization like Unilever, the scale of uh, 160,000 people. We've talked about your role as, um, as a partner in society with uh, relationships with NGOs, and, uh, but also with your employees. Uh, let's focus the last 10 minutes on, on your role as a marketer, because of course, uh, through and through, um, you are a marketer. And uh, you've just talked about the personal uh, characteristics, um, and, you know, the inspiring story, storyteller, the infectious energy, the role you play in, in, in making people uh, feel that. Uh, let's talk about the functional side. I mean, a lot has changed and you've been on the forefront. You've been, um, I think you were voted world's number one marketer in every organization that I've ever heard of over the last few years. And now you're moving on as a board member and, uh, and I'd, I'd love your reflections for our audience. These are all, you know, CMOs and CMO minus one level uh, or growth leaders that are trying to achieve change. But if you go to the function of marketing, what do you think are the key qualities, the co competencies? Noah was asking this as well for a CMO to succeed in the next few years. Great. Um, and what, while I answer that question, um, uh, one thing I'm conscious, I can see on the right hand side, there are questions coming up on, uh, from uh, people out there. Could you have a quick look at those and make I, sure? I'm, I've been reading them. No, no, oh, you I'm have. Okay, this is one of them. This is one of them. <laughs> okay, I don't, I, yeah. guilt, guilt. I didn't want to uh, leave people asking questions high and dry. Well, I think the first and most important uh, for any marketer, but I would say business person um, as well, because I actually a good business person is actually a great marketer, um, and because. They are interesting consumers and customers. So the first and most important thing, I think, is about being curious. I think curiosity is the most important thing. Um, and being curious about what's going on in the world and how you, your brand, your service uh, can, can, can uh, uh, achieve um, a future which is a more, has a more positive impact uh, on the world and on people. And you know, curiosity, one of the first things I do when I visit someone's house is I go to the bathroom um, after, you know, don't want to like, go to the loo straight away, lock the door and open the cupboards um, and uh, just see what they've got in their cupboards. Because, you get um, a lot of invitations, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, because you, you, you see, I, 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 I um, recall this story with uh, Jim Stengel, actually, so he'll know this one well when we're in Cannes once. But um, I think Mark's been curious about what, what's around you. And of course, you've got to be big market research reports, but you can also talk to friends and families together. So the first thing I think is, is, is being uh, curious. I do believe uh, being uh, people focused, put people first um, and, and real people, you know, people aren't a, a head of hair uh, looking for a shampoo or a pair of armpits looking for deodorant. They're real people with real lives and understanding uh, those, those dynamics would be a, another key important uh, one uh, I, mm. I would um, champion. I do think building brand love is, is critically important um, and branding as a mechanism as differentiation. If anyone follows me on Twitter uh, or LinkedIn uh, earlier today, I um, uh, uh, that wonderful YouTube clip that puts all the COVID ads together that all look the same, uh, you know, yeah. zero uh, differentiation. So building brand love and brands with purpose is a, a fantastic uh, way of, of achieving that. Uh, and then last but not least, um, uh, before I get onto the, the measures and, and, and delivery bit, but from a marketing perspective, it's about unlocking the magic um, and realizing that marketing is art and science. It is creativity and effectiveness. It is magic and logic. And, and more than ever, I mean, we need to get more magic and be more creative to break through the clutter and get noticed. 
but we need to have more logic and leveraging data and insight. Uh, and that's more possible than ever before. And, and building the people data centers, 33, I believe now in, in Unilever, to continually scrape the social network to give deep insight, to carry on feeding those very trends that I think uh, really helped Unilever is it, hugely important. And then the measures, I think the measures are, are actually uh, are, are, are internal on the capabilities of your people. Um, and um, you don't have to be a brilliant marketer to be a brilliant marketing leader, but you have to surround yourself by brilliant marketers. I think you have to be a very good marketer, but you uh, surround yourself with brilliant marketers. And I really believe you know, committing to training um, and committing to coaching. Um, you don't, you've never seen a football team that sits around eating uh, chips and drinking beer all week and then gets up at the weekend and give it a go. No, they train, they coach, uh, they build skills. But somehow in business, that's all seen. I don't have time for that because I'm too busy. So yeah. I believe building skills, especially for marketers in this ever-changing world, you're very quickly um, out of skill. And that's why I think you know, marketers do need to tweet and, uh, and post because they do need to watch TV and cinema and they need to live the life their consumers are, are living. And, and that capability bit's important. And then the other measure is, uh, I think you have to have measures of yes, um, distribution and penetration and, uh, and repeat uh, and, and through to the business ones of cash flow and profit and turnover, et cetera. And if you can do the metrics bit and then the capabilities bit, um, I think you can unlock the potential of your marketing team. Well, you know, it, it, it's interesting because what you just said, in many ways, um, you made a plea for, for continuous learning, for curiosity, for development, not being too busy. You mentioned your own trips to Silicon Valley when no one else was going there. I know Jim Stengel was the one that really, I think we'd both give him that credit for that, was, was the one that taught marketers, senior marketers to go to Cannes, which until then had been just a, a party for creatives. Now it became a learning place and a, and a real, uh, I think, source for inspiration for all marketers. Um, but you're bringing two sides together. I was talking to Raja of uh, MasterCard, who now is uh, the chair of both the ANA and I think the WFA too. And he's, he's known for when he got his new role for saying, I'm going to learn from everybody for the first 50 weeks. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn every week because there's so much new in marketing for me. But what he's also done, and I think you can take credit for that, as can Jim, is you've become educators. I mean, you mentioned Twitter and, uh, and, and your other social media activities. In many ways, you're also giving back. You're, you're sharing, you're educating. And, uh, you know, I was talking to Antonio Lucio about this. We have such a, as marketers, as a marketing leader, you have such an education role um, among the non-marketers, but also among the marketers, don't you? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And, and, and I do think um, social media is a great way of, of, of sharing those. And, um, uh, I, I, and I can't be talking total rubbish, but I'll let you be the judge. You know? uh, I have managed to get a few, uh, a few hundred thousand followers. But what I try and do is uh, pass on... Um, uh, interesting things I see or interesting things that, that, are, that are going on um, and it's in a way you could never have done before I mean it was it was quite difficult to do continuous learning uh, you had to be a, a real student and, and buy books and all that stuff but now actually if you just graze a little bit um, you can pick up all sorts of different uh, insights um, and, um, and and also at the same time you know living the space and, and be, being a, um, a, a person that understands from others as well, because we're, we're all still learning. Well, you know, you, you make a really important point, which um, is probably a good closing thought. Um, a lot of people talk about uh, the, the importance now of right brain and left brain, data and creativity, and you've mentioned that uh, as well. Uh, many people talk about that, but, um, and, and we captured that with the sort of Da Vinci uh, shortcut. But what are, not a lot of people know is that Da Vinci was both an engineer and an artist, but he was also one of the founders of the humanist movement. Satya Nadella is a humanist. So many of the big leaders, and I would say that you, with all your work at Unilever, have brought back the focus on the human across all stakeholders and your colleagues and the organizations you work with. And that's so much bigger than the customer or the consumer. It's the humans you work with. And, and Keith, I think everyone listening will take away from this, not only that it's possible, but it's been done. The data is there. The results in business results are there. 
and, and I think you've, you've paved the way for many to follow. So I really want to thank you for your uh, willingness to share, not just what went well, but also what didn't. On behalf of everyone listening, so many thanks. Well, uh, th well, thank you very much. And thanks so many uh, people to, to uh, join. But uh, the one thing I'd like to leave you one thought. Um, you chose to become a, a marketer, um, and that's why we're talking about marketing. Uh, you didn't choose to become an accountant or an investment banker or a taxidermist or whatever. Being a marketer is fun. Um, it's, uh, it is about curiosity. It is about serving people. Uh, and I think we've got to remember more than ever right now, um, have some fun doing all this. I, I'm a great believer that miserable people deliver miserable results. And marketers should bring some fun uh, and some excitement into business. Uh, and through that, yes, of course, we'll bring uh, growth and we'll serve consumers better but we'll bring a little bit of uh, hope and energy as well. So thanks very much for being with you. I've seen the questions. I, I'd love to see them all afterwards because I haven't been able to read them because I've been uh, answering. Uh, I saw one from Jim asking which Procter & Gamble or Unilever product was I using the most? Um, and you'll be glad to know uh, the one I'm really thriving on is something that will mean nothing to uh, all your American colleagues is uh, Marmite, um, uh, which I'm finding particularly tasty right now because it's got that wonderful uh, savoury, uh, it's a Unilever product, a very UK product, uh, yeah. with the line, love it or hate it. Um, and um, I, I love it. So a lot of Marmite on text. But anyway. Lots of uh, applause and thank you from the, the chat panel coming across. Keith, wonderful talking to you. Everyone listening and viewing, uh, thank you for joining us next week. It's Paul Pullman uh, for the other side of the same story. Thank you. Keith, all the best. Yeah. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Nice talking to you all.